good to be here with you all this morning. Amen. Thank uh, Pastor Stefan for uh, giving me the privilege and entrusting me uh, with the fellowship with you all. Uh, him knowing that I'm going to feed you the best that I can, but not uh, any different than what he would do, especially when it comes to doctrine. Amen. And I want you all to know that it's no light thing when a pastor um, extends his pulpit to another preacher. That means that Amen. he has confidence in him that he's going to be uh, faithful uh, in his preaching and do the same thing that the pastor would do uh, when it comes to taking care of the flock. Amen. So uh, that being said, uh, he has confidence in me, and so I pray that y'all uh, would just pray for me this morning as well. Amen? Amen. I also want to thank you all for the love that you've shown, just a lot of love. I had to uh, kind of uh, just restrain myself from coming every Sunday. <laughs> Y'all need to stop. But, uh, but it's, it's something, you know, you know, I was a little torn about what I was going to talk about, but I will tell you this. Um, if and uh, the pastor sees fit to have me back again, I want to talk about this thing about love because it is a strong thing that we have to exhibit in the body of Christ, yes. and especially in this time. Yes. Um, uh, this morning I was looking at a clip where uh, a church was just uh, divided mm -hmm. and uh, the bottom line was there was just a lack of love mm -hmm. and that's the kind of thing that yeah. the enemy wants to see yes. and so I want y'all to be encouraged that it has nothing to do with the size of a church mm -hmm. uh, if, if you're small and intimate like this and you have the love of Christ that's what God is, is, is honored by amen? Yeah. amen so this morning I want to encourage you uh, picking up off of uh, where we um, just got finished celebrating from last week with uh, uh, the Resurrection Sunday. Amen. One of the things that my heart has been grieved about is that the church doesn't do um, enough when it comes to celebrating uh, the resurrection of Christ. Uh, when the world talks about celebrating, they celebrate hard whatever they go after. Uh, they talk about Mardi Gras. I think the Mardi Gras goes on for about a week or two. But in the hearts of the people, it's all year because those folks are preparing um, all the time, constantly for the parades and the beads and everything else that they're going to do. And you know how it is. People do this when it comes to celebrating. But when it comes to celebrating the resurrection of Christ or even uh, Christmas, the birth of Christ, uh, we do a poor job. And so I thought that this morning we would uh, reflect um, on, on what is uh, taking place. So this morning, if you would, please... Uh, would you open your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 24, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24? <clears throat> the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. I want to begin at verse uh, 46. Luke chapter 24, beginning at verse 46. And one of the things I'd like to encourage folks to do is if somebody next to you doesn't have a Bible, share with them so that they can uh, see what we're, what we're reading. Amen. Uh, one of the things people need to be encouraged with in the church is following along yes. Um, yes. in the Word of God uh, with, with folks. I had uh, uh, one of my former parishioners uh, last week, we, we crossed paths and uh, sharing with me that one of the discouragements that they were experiencing and searching for a new church is um, uh, a couple of places that they've been to, uh, the scripture was read and then the Bible was closed and that was it. And of course they went off on a tangent. Um, but, but what we need is we need to be fed line upon line and precept upon precept um, upon the word. That's what we need. That's why we have our Bibles because we need to follow along with what the preacher is saying. Yes. Uh, a lot of times people want to accuse the preacher of making up stuff. But if you see it written right there, uh, there's no excuse. Amen? Amen? So that's why we have to share uh, the word of God when we look at it. All right, beginning at verse 46, if you dare say amen. Amen. Oh, I'm sorry, let's go back to verse 44. Then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding. Somebody say open. Open. That they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, 
Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary. Say necessary. necessary. It was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from one high. So today, we want to talk from the subject of it was necessary. Yes, it was necessary. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful this morning that you have allowed us to come to your throne of grace. God, it is necessary that we pray and pray often because your word says man ought always to pray and not to become faint-hearted. And so we thank you, God, that you have provided for us the necessary things that we need for this spiritual journey. Your word says come boldly before the throne of grace that we might find help in our time of need. The songwriter said we need thee every hour. Yeah. We need thee. And so, God, we thank you this morning that you have purposed in our hearts to come together as your people collectively and individually that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. God, this morning we confess that when we look at ourselves, we see that we are undone. But we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, that we can stand today justified, justified in his righteousness, God, as though we had done nothing. And so we agree with your word that uh, you're right and we're wrong. We agree, God, that your word uh, encourages us to confess all of our sins and shortcomings, that you might cleanse us and uh, forgive us from all of our unrighteousness. And we thank you for your faithfulness in that way. So, God, we confess this morning that we've sinned by way of omission and commission, word, thought, and deed. And we ask you, God, to strengthen us where we weep, rebuild us where we've been torn down, and encourage us along the way. We ask you now, God, that as we look upon your word, that you will bind the efforts of our adversary. Yes. God, we ask you to encourage our hearts and illuminate our minds yes. that we might be able to receive and see what only you can reveal to us. Our prayer, God, is that when all is said and done, you will receive the honor, the glory, and the praise. For this we thank you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. So when I was a child growing up, uh, one of the things that I, that I regretted and, 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 and really did not look forward to was uh, a particular tradition that we had in our household uh, during the fall season. And that was everybody would line up to get their shot of cod liver oil. How many of you all? How many of you all come from that era where you had to get that shot of cod liver oil in the in the fall? Now everybody has to line up and get flu shots. But back then it was get that cod liver oil. And that cod liver oil, you didn't have a chaser to follow behind that. Somebody say amen. You didn't have, so, so all day long, all day long, you were, you were tasting that nasty cod liver oil. But the reason we took it was for two reasons. One, because we had to. We don't have it like these children have today. They have say on what they will do and what they don't want to do. Somebody say amen. amen. I don't know what kind of parents they got, but they weren't the kind of parents that I came up underneath for. You didn't have no say when I was a child. They didn't want to cry about being abused. I got the greatest cry. I can tell some stories. Times I want to say something. You better not. You better they do like But the other reason we took that car number all because they had convinced us that it was necessary. Yes. They convinced us that it was necessary. Mm -hmm. And as time went by, we began to see the benefits mm -hmm. of taking that car level oil. So now some of us, now that we're old enough to decide whether we want to or not, some of us we still take that car level oil. Let me see your hands for those of you. I'm the only crazy <laughs> one. <laughs> Listen, listen, when we think about uh, things that are necessary, uh, sometimes 
the process of that which is necessary is not always pleasant. And we don't understand it when we're going through uh, why sometimes some things that God allows us to be subject to. And there are times when there are trials that take place in our life, we can't see the bigger picture. But we have to encourage ourselves, as David did, that God is in control, Amen. that he loves us still, and that, as Paul said in Romans 8, 28, all things, I say all things, all work things. together for the good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Amen. So we have to believe that, even though we don't understand why whatever we're going through is necessary. And I want to encourage somebody here this morning that whatever it is that you're going through, it may be trying, it may be challenging, it may be bewildering to you. But trust that God knows that it is necessary in your growth as a believer. Uh, if, even if it's no more than to cause you to pray. Listen, God allows things to happen to cause us to pray because it's necessary that we develop the discipline of communion with him. Somebody need to say amen. amen. So we pick up this story here of the road to Emmaus where there were two disciples who had witnessed uh, the events leading up to the crucifixion of Christ and also uh, the, 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 the story that they were hearing about the resurrection of Christ. What has happened here at the end is that Christ is now confirming to uh, the rest of the disciples who had barricaded themselves up in a, in a holding place so that they would not be arrested after they saw what had happened to Jesus. Uh, they had gotten word that Jesus had uh, risen again, but were not convinced. And I want you to know that, uh, that you don't have to be in Missouri to be from Missouri. I said you don't have to be in Missouri to be from Missouri. There are a lot of people who are walking around who don't believe uh, I was going to say they don't believe something stink until they smell it, but that's what the old folks would say. But but y'all y'all hear what I'm saying? They were the saying what they gave you cod liver oil. They gave you all I'm saying. So, but they don't believe stuff until they see it for themselves. They're not convinced, and they don't exercise the faith that they should. And so I want to backtrack here uh, because uh, what Christ had to reassure them, He had to reassure them that hey, listen. What transpired, even though it may have seemed to be a, a awful thing, but yet at the same time, it was necessary. Yes, sir. It was necessary. And I got news for you. There have been so many things that I've seen in my time uh, within churches that have transpired, but yet at the same time, it was necessary. So I've learned not to look at everything as being so bad and being so awful and so unfortunate, but look, trying to look at it from God's perspective that, hey, listen, it's a necessary thing, and these things, they take place. So we go back, we go back um, a little bit, we go back a little bit, and we look at uh, verse 13 of chapter 24, verse 13. I just want to read for just a little bit, so just try to follow along with me, but not only following along, I need you to try to use your imagination. Put yourself there and try to see what is taking place. Try to use your imagination to visualize just what is going on. Now, the resurrection has taken place. Word has gone out uh, from Mary um, after the angels had reassured her that Jesus is not there, Peter and John, they race to go to the tomb to see for themselves. And, uh, and now you have two other uh, disciples. They were not of the circle of the twelve. Uh, a lot of times we get upset because we're not in the inner circle. Somebody need to talk to me. Amen. We get upset sometimes because we're not in the in the in the in crowd. Amen. But you don't necessarily have to be on the in crowd to be a follower of Christ Amen. when it comes to following him. Amen. And so these two, they were two disciples on the outside, on the peripheral, if you will, of followers of Christ uh, that were convinced of his ministry and, 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 and real 
uh, supporters of him. And the two of them, verse 13 says that they were uh, traveling to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And what they were doing in verse 14 is they were talking together of all these things which had happened. Now, I want to stop right there and say this real quick, is that what they were doing was they were reflecting and reviewing over the events that had transpired. Because sometimes when you can't make sense of something, it's good to have people around you that you can talk with. And you can bounce things off of and you can run things by them and they can help you to come to some kind of understanding about what has happened. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? Yes. And so the two of them were together and they were talking about this thing and it was and it, and it, and it, and it was heartfelt to them. It was heartfelt to them because of what Christ meant to them. Christ was their hope. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as far as they were concerned, this was a big disappointment that they had been let down because of the hope that they had in him. And so they were talking about this thing. Verse 15 says, while they conversed and they reasoned, going back and forth trading notes, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes, verse 16 says, were restrained so that they did not know him. Now what this here tells us is this, is that Christ had a, a glorified appearance in his resurrected body. Because from a historical standpoint, what we understand is that the beating and the torture that Christ experienced, his, he, he was beyond recognition. Yes, sir. You couldn't have recognized him. So now he has been resurrected, and you'll see in a little bit that this is the same body, but yet in his appearance, what he has done, he has done something different, showing a glorified appearance so that they did not recognize who he was. And Christ did that for a reason. And the reason that he did that was because he wanted to walk with them for a minute to hear their story and to allow them to vent. Because sometimes the best healing that people can get is somebody to just listen to them. Amen. Amen. I learned from a counselor, I learned from a counselor, he said, you know, he said, sometimes, he said, all you need to do when you have a counseling session with people is just sit there and go, hmm, mm-hmm, hmm, 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 and he says, and then after you've done that, he said, the people get up and they thank you so much for all the counseling that you gave them. And all you did was just listen. And sometimes people just need a, a venue where they can just get it out. Yes, so that's why everybody used to hang out at Cheers. Right? Y'all remember Cheers? Yeah. Remember Cheers? I didn't ask y'all if y'all were, you know, constituents of Cheers. I just asked y'all, do you remember Cheers? Yeah. Come on and talk to me. And, and, so the, and so the theme song was, you know, a place where everybody knows your name. Right? Why did people go there? They didn't go there because they could get the suds and all that other kind of stuff. They went there because they were people who were like them who just needed somebody to listen to them. Amen. And I'm telling you today, that's why people like water holes today and happy hours. It's because they are unhappy, but yet they need to find a place where somebody will just listen to them. Y'all not listening to me this morning. And so Jesus allowed them to vent a little bit. And he asks them, he asks them, um, verse 17, he said, what kind of conversation, what is it that y'all are talking about? What are y'all talking about with one another? And, 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 and you're walking and, and you're sad at the same time while all this is going on. One of the things that we know about Jesus in his attributes is that he is omniscient. Mm -hmm. He knows everything. <laughs> So then why is he asking them what are they talking about? He's asking them because he understands that sometimes you need to ask, a, ask the right questions to draw out stuff from people. That's, that's, that's wisdom of knowing how to just draw things out of people. Hey, listen to me. Sometimes when folks get into some stuff that they had no business getting into and they have to be interrogated, they know, the interrogators know how to ask certain questions to draw stuff out of folks. And what Jesus wanted to do, he wanted to draw the grief out of them. He wanted, to, he wanted them to, to, to tell 
him what was going on. I, I just said something right there. I'm going to say it one more time. He wanted him, he wanted them to tell him what was going on with them. Y'all yes. not listening to me. Yes. You see, the songwriter said, have a little talk with Jesus. Yes. Just a little talk with him does what? It makes everything all right. And we need to spend more time talking with him when we're going through our sadness and when there's grief in our lives just to pour ourselves out before him. Well, yes. after they asked this, he asked them this question, um, they looked at him in, in shock. And verse 18 tells us who the one of those two disciples was, says his name was Cleophas. And he answered and said to him, what? Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And Jesus said to them, what things? Playing along with him. So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. Now I want to stop before I go further. Because what happened here was this. They said, are you the only stranger? In other words, they were saying, hey, listen, the things that happened to Jesus, it ain't no secret. This thing was common knowledge. Everybody knew it. Something had to be wrong with you. Not You must not be from around here. People can tell when you're a stranger in the community. They can tell when you're a stranger in the community. You go on places and you visit them. They know you're an outsider. Not just only by your dialect, but the fact that you don't know the history of what's going on there. Because they would look at you and say, why, why are you conducting yourself like this? Don't you know where you at? And they look at him and say, you know, you're the only one that don't know the things that happened to Jesus. So that just tells us that this stuff was common knowledge that everybody in that region, they knew what had happened with Christ. They knew all of the events. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Even though some of the people may not have been there to see for themselves, but you always had those faithful tail bearers. Yes. Yes. Even today, you don't necessarily have to have people who are going to tweet and text. You got those folks who are too glad to tell it. That's right. Oh, yeah. So they asked them, say, well, you know, where, where, where have you been at that you don't know what has happened? And they, and they said, and the things which happened to him in these days. Now, Jesus says to them something very important. He says, what things? What things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, he was mighty indeed in word before God and all the people. Now they're giving him his props. They're giving him his props. And in verse 20, they begin to, 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 to share what had happened. They says, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. Now let me tell you something. They gave a summary and they were very brief. But you know, sometimes when folks want to tell a story, they can embellish it. <laughs> or uh, as they used to say when I was coming up, they would add some yeast to it. Hey! <laughs> because if they get an audience of people and they know somebody's listening, and, they, and, and, and so they could have been like, you know, and, 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 so, and, so, and so what had happened was the, uh, the, 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 the chief priest, he, he came out there and you should have seen how he carried on. And he got all the rules in them, and they got the people all worked up and everything. Oh, my Lord, it was a shame. You should have seen the ruckus that was going on out there, how they carried on. And then they arrested him, and they treated him like he was a criminal. They even cuffed him and shackled him and dragged him. It was a shame before God what they did to him. And then not only that. They, 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 they began to beat up on him. They took his clothes off of him, left the poor man out there naked. You know that ain't right. <laughs> and then, and then, and then, then they checking to see if you're listening. And then, and then, and then, and then, and then they put a crown of thorns on his head. Oh, my Lord, you should have seen the blood running down his face like that. And then if that wasn't enough, Lord Jesus, they, they stooped a little bit lower. And they began to beat him. 
And then they had the nerve to spit on you. know, that's the, the, the most despicable thing that you can do to anybody is to spit on somebody. <laughs> Come on. Man. They could have, I mean, they really could have embellished the story. But they didn't. They just stayed to the point and gave a, a, a brief analysis of what happened. Jesus is right there with them, and they don't even know. Hey, hey, listen, 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 listen. And one of the things that me and a couple of my friends, we, we, we had this thing uh, uh, amongst us that we say, when we go places, you have to be careful because you don't know who's who or what's what. And the reason you exercise that practice is because it helps you to watch what you're saying. Because sometimes you're talking to people and you don't know who you're talking to. You got to be careful what you say. So now they didn't know that they were talking to Jesus. That's right. Supposing they stood up there and added stuff to it. And then later on found out. And let me tell you something. It makes you upset when you find out that the person you were talking to, they knew all along. They knew all along, but they didn't let you know. They just went along with you and played with you. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. But you're just too quiet this morning. So, 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 so he asked them, you know, what things, and they talked about, you know, what had happened. So verse 21, they said, you know, we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. And not only that, verse 22, certain women of our company, they weren't calling their name, who arrived at the tomb early, we know who they were, they astonished us. When they didn't find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Verse 25, then he said to them, oh, foolish ones. And slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Stop right there. Because he just said something. Yes, sir. He said foolish one. Yeah. Foolish one. Foolish one. Now, when he was saying, when he called them foolish, he was saying it in the term of recognizing their weakness. Because foolishness was a title that was usually given to wicked individuals. That's right. To wicked people. They were called foolish, doing foolish things. How many of y'all uh, been around people who, who just constantly making foolish decisions? Uh, they, they're destructive, and they damage everything that they had. They don't take care of nothing, and, and they won't take care of whatever you got. They, they jeopardize whatever you have. Uh, they're the kind of people you try to stay away from. Now, I'm trying to be careful about what I'm saying, because sometimes you don't know who's who or what's what. <laughs> Amen. So when he called them foolish, he wasn't calling them wicked. He was saying that they were weak Amen. in their belief. They were weak in their belief. And he said, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Let me say this. Let me say this. All they had at the time was the Old Testament scriptures. And the Old Testament scriptures always pointed to the things that Christ was going to suffer. We're going to see that in a little bit. But it is, it, is, it is not uncommon for people to have the word of God and see it in writing and see what it says and yet are slow to believe yes, sir. what it says. Many of us would be better off in our walk, further along in our growth, if we just Accept the word of God and believe it in our hearts. I've been, I've been surprised time and time and time again in, in the pastorate of folks who have basically been raised up underneath a sound doctrine and can quote the word back and forward, but yet still have unbelief in their heart when it comes to accepting the word of God. It's something that we, we wrestle with and we have to learn to trust him and trust him completely. Somebody say amen. amen. Verse 26, he says, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them 
in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, I will tell you that when we talk about, when he says beginning that Moses is talking about uh, the first five books, the, 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 the Pentateuch there, and he's talking about all the other uh, uh, prophets and, 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 and the things that, that they said uh, pointing to, to, to what Christ was going to experience. And then verse 28 says, they drew near to the village where they were going, so they came to their, to their destination. And basically as they come to their destination and Jesus is with them, they're going to stop and say, okay, well, you know, we, we've gotten to, uh, to, to, to where we are. And so Jesus was like, you know what, well, well look, you know, good talking with y'all. i got to continue to go on. And verse 29 says they constrained him and saying, no, 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 hold, hold up, hold on, hold up. Don't go, don't go, stay here with us. And not only that, look, it's, 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 it's late in the evening. The day is, is just about gone. Uh, just stay here with us for a while. We can accommodate you. And so it says he went in to stay with them. Verse 30. Now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he took bread, blessed, and broke it and gave it to them. Verse 31, then their eyes were open and they knew him and he vanished from their sight and they said to one another, did you see that? Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? Well, this is the thing about the word of God. So, so much you want to say, you don't yes, have sir. the time to say all the things you want to say. But listen, what he did was they invited him as a guest. And as a guest, what does he do? He takes the lead and acts like a host. Yes. Why? Because that's who he is. He is used to humbling himself and being a servant. That's what he did. He served them at their meal that they invited him to. Y'all not listening to me. See, when it's in you, 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 you don't need nobody to provoke you to do it. Amen. It just comes out automatically, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. If it's, if it's in you, if it's a part of you, you're going to do it no matter where you are. And when he did that, when he did that, he revealed who he was just by doing it. You know why? Because they knew what nobody else going to do nothing like that but Jesus. And not only that, their minds went back to the feeding of the 5,000. Their minds went back to some other things. Hey, listen to me. Sometimes when we're going through something and we're looking for the Lord to come through, all you need to do is reflect on where he has brought you from in the past and how he has worked and moved, and you'll begin to see. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. The Lord is in this thing. He is in this thing. The other thing here that I point, want to point out to you, it says, and they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? Now, here's what we need to understand. You cannot appreciate the word of God unless God opens up your eyes to be able to see. Amen. 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 The, 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 the main rule that you must exercise when you come to study the word of God is you need to pray that God would open up your eyes to be able to see what he wants to show you. Because if he don't make it clear to you, you're just getting served. You're just scratching at the surface. Yes, I remember when, when, I was, when I was lost, when I was unsaved. And uh, had an old piece of Bible around. And, and what would I do? I would do like everybody else. Go to the book of Revelation. And want to read about the apocalypse. And all this stuff about the coming of, uh, of Christ. And what's going to happen with, with, the, uh, with the devil. And, and, and the demons. And all that kind of stuff. And then run around talk to people like I'm knowledgeable about the Bible. Just as ignorant as I can be. And the only thing I can tell them was there's six, six, six. Oh, and let me tell you something. I found that the Bible was the hardest thing to read at that time. But when I gave my life to Christ and sat down and started reading his word, I was amazed at how my eyes were open to see his word and to, and to see what was going on. And not only that, they said that their hearts were burning, burning with joy. Hey, listen, what it was was that the reason they didn't want him to go on any further because what they were getting from him was so good, they didn't want to let him go. And I don't understand how people can start off in their walk with Christ and then come to a place where they just abandon him. 
Once you have experience his move in your life, you realize there's nothing else like it and you don't want to let it go. It is too good to let go. And so they said our hearts burn within us. We wanted more of this because he was expounding to us. He was teaching us some stuff along the way, some things that we had never thought about. And that's what happens when you fellowship, when you spend time with the Lord. When you fellowship with him, he will show you some things. Well, we're getting closer to the outline now because in verse, verse 33, they got up. Now, they're supposed to be bunking down for the night. But what do they do? They get up. Because I told y'all, some you got some people when they get something, they can't hold on to it. They gotta tell it. They got they gotta tell it. You know, you know, you know the old folks would say, run, tell that. Yeah. Right, right. They got to go, they got to go. So look at verse 33. They rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together. Ho, 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 y'all, but guess what? The Lord, he is up. He has risen and he's appeared to Simon. Verse 35, and they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Amen. Now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, uh, peace to you. Yeah. But they were terrified and frightened, supposing that they had seen a spirit. The word spirit there means basically a ghost. Mm -hmm. Now what has happened here is that when you look at the other gospels, they give their account uh, uh, Mark and, and John and, and, and Matthew what, is, what has happened here is that uh, Jesus has now uh, come back uh, to the place where they were supposed to be meeting him and now he is he has basically uh, beat them back there because the only thing they did was they left him not knowing where he was going to go but Jesus knowing what they was going to do he meets them right where they are Amen. and he begins to verify the things on their behalf. Now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst and said to them, peace to you. This ain't the time to be, be scared. Verse 37, but they were terrified and frightened suppose they had seen the spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Verse 39, I'm going to give you something that's going to convince you. Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is myself. Handle me and see. See, it's not enough to see. Now you got to touch. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Verse 40, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marvel, he said to them, have you any food here? So they were happy and excited. Have you been so happy? So happy that you just can't get yourself together because you'd be like, you know what? I just can't believe this. Yeah. Amen. I saw a news clip last night where a young boy was at a, uh, uh, at, a, at, a, at a at a baseball game recently, and he got the privilege to be there to sit in the dugout. And as he's sitting in the dugout, he's got a ball in his hand, and he doesn't know it. He doesn't know it. But then all of a sudden, here comes his favorite baseball player. And he comes up to him, and the boy is, 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 is just dumbfounded. He's looking, huh? And he says, here, let me sign that for you. Mm -hmm. He signed it for him. Then he says, let's get a selfie together. He takes a selfie with him. And the boy is still trying to you know, process all of this. He can't believe it. Then he takes him by the hand. He says, hey, come on, walk with me down here. And he takes him down there. And then he gives him a bat. And he wishes him well. And then he leaves the boy. And the boy is sitting there, got an autograph ball, the picture. And he's got a bat in his hand. And he just can't believe what just happened. And he's like, Joy can leave you spellbound. It can leave you speechless. Not that you don't believe it, but you just processing what just happened because it's something that you really desire, but for it to see it actually happen to you, it's, it's, it, it just leaves you dumbfounded for just a moment. And so while all of this has happened, Jesus said to him, look, you know what? Uh, I'm hungry. Y'all got any food? Y'all got any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb. I'm trying to figure out what kind of diet that is. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> fish in honeycomb. But uh, high protein, okay. Well, then we need to copy that recipe. <laughs> he took it and ate in their presence to let them know, hey, listen, to verify further, hey, listen, this is a real body, and I'm actually going to go through the motion of eating food with you. Now we come down to our outline. The three things I want to share with you real quickly is, number one, because it was necessary, the necessity. Number two, the need. And thirdly, the news. Verse 44, he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets in the Psalms concerning me. Now, what were these things that were written there in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms? Well, here's what they were. Number one, that he must suffer. That he must suffer. It was in Psalm 22, verses 1 through 22, and Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 9. I read that scripture here on a, a Good Friday. But, but listen, he was saying that this was necessary. It was necessary that I suffered. And I got, I, I, I just really want to want, want y'all to understand this here. Most of you all, I'm looking at, you're old enough to know this. In life, there's going to be some suffering. Yes. Yes. In life, there's going to be some suffering. Sometimes you see it coming, and sometimes you don't see it coming. But if you live long enough, you're going to endure some suffering. Because it comes with the journey of life. As a result of the fall of man, we have to go through suffering in life. Don't like it. Don't feel good. But it is necessary. And Jesus said to them that there was the necessity for me having to go through this because the word had already predicted or prophesied that I would suffer in the way that I had. Secondly, the thing that it said was that I would rise again from the dead the third day. Psalm 16.10 and Jonah 1.7 and Hosea chapter 6 verse 2. These Old Testament scriptures, they said that. They referred to that Christ would ex uh, actually uh, uh, be buried and rise on the third day. That he had to go through that. And then the third thing was this. The most important thing that was pointed out. The reason why he had to go through what he went through was because Repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Beginning at Jerusalem. And it says here in verse 45, and he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. In my research, what I found out that the chapter here, verse 24, was a uh, a chapter full of open things. Go back to verse 12. Luke 24 verse 12. Go back to verse 12 real quick. Go back to verse 12. Uh, it says, But Peter arose and ran to the tomb and stooping down he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves and he departed marveling to himself at what had happened. So the tomb had been opened. The tomb had been opened. Then when you come over to verse uh, 29 to 29. But they constrained him, uh, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward even and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Well, it was as a result of that that he opened up his eyes, uh, or they opened their home to him. Verse 31. Then their eyes were what? Open. Their eyes were open in verse 31. Uh, go to verse 32. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us? While he talked with us on the road and while he did what? Open the scriptures to us. A lot of opening going on. Look at verse 35. And they told about the things that he had, that happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. He opened up their understanding. In verse 45, verse 45, he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. So a lot of opening was taking place. 
God was opening stuff up to them. A lot of times when we're in the dark about things, that's what we want. We want our understanding to be opened up. But what he was saying here in verse uh, 46 is that he says, it was written and thus it was necessary. Hey, this is what I want to say to you. He says it was written, thus it was necessary. God is a God who cannot lie. Amen. And if he said something is going to take place, it's got to come to pass. Yes. And so Christ said that there was a necessity that it was necessary for me to have to go through the things that I went through. Why? Because the word had already predicted it. Verse 47. Verse 47. We see the need. We see the need. He says, he says that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So one of the things that Jesus had told the disciples, you shall receive power. After the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses uh, of me to, to the whole world. Beginning in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Why? Because the need for repentance and remission, forgiveness, should be preached. So Jesus came. He came to establish the kingdom agenda. Now it was the disciples' job to continue to promote it. What Jesus started, we have the privilege of carrying it on. Somebody say amen. amen. And so he is saying that, listen, it was uh, of necessity. It was necessary that the necessity had to be carried out, but also because there is a need. And the need is that men, mankind, people need to hear John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting everlasting life. Yes, Amen. Amen. The world needs to hear the preaching of them repenting, yes. turning away from their wicked ways, and then turning to Jesus Christ. Yes. They need to hear that good news yes. of which the gospel is. Yes. Because that's what Christ came for. Yes. The Bible says, how shall people hear unless somebody preach? Yes. Take the words to them. And so we have that responsibility to tell them about the need for forgiveness. Let me tell you something. When I heard that message, how God could forgive me, boy, I sat back and I looked at the list that I had. I didn't have just one list. Didn't have just two lists. I had some mess that I needed to be forgiven of. And y'all might have been, you know, y'all might have been okay, good moral people or whatever. And you might not have did anything when you were younger. And, you know, you might have been born, born, you know, in, in, in a good upbringing and all that kind of stuff. But I had some mess with me. And I was living a miserable life. And going to church sometimes. When I wanted to feel good, would go to church. But after church was over, we'd stand out there, smoke a cigarette, and talk about how good the service was. Don't ask me what was preached. I couldn't put the told you. The only thing I knew was that the choir, they hollered. Somebody got their little dance on. And, um, and, 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 and they didn't uh, take all my money. Y'all y'all playing. But those are, the things, those are the things that people are concerned about when they're religious. That's, that's what they're concerned about when they go to church. You know, what, what the preacher going to do, what the choir going to do, and how much money they're going to take from you. You know, because, you know, you know how these churches do sometimes with some of these offerings. Eh? And that's what people are concerned about. So I'll go to church, you know, ready for all of that kind of stuff. And then leave feeling good that I've been to church, that I've been to church. And then come Monday, I'm back in that rut again. Doing what I was doing. You know, just carrying on. But when I came to the end and saw that I needed a change, there was somebody there that was able to tell me about repentance. And tell me about how God could forgive me. That, that was the thing that, that I had to come to come to grips with. That he could forgive me. Because only he knew. The things that I had done. Yes. You know, there are people who thought that they knew me. 
They didn't know me like they thought they knew me. Now they knew some things about me, but there was some stuff they didn't know. And and went to their grave not knowing. And guess what? I'm going to my grave not telling them. <laughs> but God knows. And I needed forgiveness of that stuff. And I needed to be set free. And Jesus said it was necessary. That he suffered on the cross for me. It was necessary that he shed his blood for me. It was necessary that he got up because he was the first fruit of the resurrection. Because he got up, I can get up from my mess. He said it was necessary. And I say it's necessary. Because had he not done it, I'd have no hope today. I'd still just be somebody that's just religious, standing back on one side, you know, criticizing the church, and then on the other side, coming in when I need, you know, a little prayer, or whatever. But now I have Jesus. I ain't got to go through the motions no more. I got Jesus. All because he looked and he said, it was necessary. And there's still people today that he looks at and he sees the mess that's going on in their lives, the wickedness that we see on the news and the people that we see around us, the stuff going on, it was necessary. Because if not, there would be no other hope. Jesus is still the only answer for the world today. And then lastly, there's the news because look what he tells them in verse 48 and verse 49. He says, and you, you are witnesses of these things. The word witness is a courtroom term. People who come in and give testimony of what they've seen. Hey, y'all listen to me. If you have received Christ and you know what he's done in your life, you can stand up and be a witness. Not because of something that you heard. Not because of something that you stood off in the peripheral and saw. But because you looked at yourself. And you can be a witness. There was a, there was a blind man. Who was calling out to Jesus. And it wasn't Bartimaeus at this particular time. But it was another one. And when Jesus restored his sight. He, 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 he wanted to go with Jesus. And Jesus said no. Go back to your people. And, and, and tell them the good news. And the people asked him, said, well, what do you say about this man? He said, look, I don't know much to tell you, but all I know is that where I once was blind, but now I see. That's a witness. And I can't tell you as a witness of what he did for somebody else, even though I've seen him work in other people's lives, but I'm a better witness of what he has done in my life. I'm a witness. I'm a witness. People can say what they want to say about Jesus. I'm like Pilate. I find no fault in him. I find no fault in him. He's been good to me. He's been good to me better than I ever deserved. He's been good to me. And so I'm a witness. I'm a living witness. Of what he can do. When someone gives their life over to him. When they surrender. Completely over to Jesus Christ. I'm a witness. And he says to them, as witnesses, you ought to go and speak of these things because you can tell it from first hand. See, sometimes you don't need no second hand knowledge. You don't need no second hand knowledge. What you need to ask people sometimes, well, tell me, what did he do for you? Uh, what, did he, what did he do for you? Because, hey, listen, one of the problems that we're having today is that in some churches, you have individuals in the pulpit preaching stuff that they don't even believe. Did you hear what I said? Preaching stuff that they don't even believe or have not even received. Have not even received. Here's a story I like to tell. Uh, I think I was telling Deacon about it when we were talking uh, during, during the anniversary. And I was talking about how 
uh, uh, what Preacher Brown would do at the end of every service, and what is customary, is he would give the invitation. And the invitation, let me tell you something, when people start talking about the doors of the church is open, that's all it is. The doors of the church are open. That's not an invitation. That's not an invitation to, to come to follow Jesus Christ, right? So this, 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 this preacher from uh, another church about a few blocks away had come to Manor and he joined. And the pastor being, you know, hospitable to him, recognizing him as a, as a, as a, as a, as a minister and come from background. So he allowed him to sit uh, up there with him and, and, and the rest of the ministers. And so the pastor would preach every week, give the invitation like he normally does. And then after a couple of months, one Sunday, the pastor's giving an invitation and the preacher, he gets up. And he comes down to the front to receive Jesus Christ Amen. as his Savior. Yes. And people sitting there talking about, huh? Wow. What? Yes. Wow. Because what has happened? There are people who have not become witnesses, and yet at the same time, they try to proclaim this word. <laughs> Let me tell you something. The best witness is a person who has been affected. By this word of God. When they've seen what Christ has done in their lives. And he said to them, you are witnesses of these things because you have walked with me. You have you can give credibility to my testimony and what I've done. Amen. Let me finish this and say this here, this last thing. He says to them in verse 49, he says, behold, I send the promise of my father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem. Until you are endued with power from on high. Okay. So we understand. We understand. Those of us who are Bible students. Been around for a minute. We know what has happened. He told them. To go there to the upper room. And wait. For the Holy Spirit to come. Because he had already told them. That you shall be witnesses. But when? After. The Holy Spirit has come upon you. Because this is what we need to understand. You can't do anything in your own strength, in your power. Amen. It's only when you receive, I think somebody said it not long ago, when you receive supernatural power Amen. that can only come from Jesus Christ. Yes. See, what he can do is he can take ordinary people yes. and do extraordinary things with them. Yes. I'm going to go old school for just a minute. Denny Bell Hall, who used to sing with Andre Crouch and the Disciples, she sang that song, Just Ordinary People. Ordinary people. That's what God wants to use, just ordinary people. You don't have to be nobody special. You don't have to have no special gifts or talents. You don't have to have all these credentials and stuff. All you need to do is just be a blood wash, spirit-filled believer, and follower of Jesus Christ and he can take you and do some marvelous things with you. When Peter, when Peter and them were standing before the Sanhedrin and they were challenging them about what they had done to Christ and they looked at him and said, hey, wait a minute, listen to how he's speaking. He's speaking of a, as a knowledgeable person and we know it's nothing but a fisherman. Where all that coming from? It's coming from Jesus. Using them. Using them. He says in verse 49 that we need to take the news. Yeah. Why? Because we are witnesses of Jesus Christ. We're not just, just believers and, and, and followers, but we are his witnesses. We can give testimony for what he has done. And then not only that, he's given us the power to do it. Yeah. And a lot of times we feel like we're incapable yeah. of going forth and preaching the word of God mm -hmm. and sharing it with other people. We think that we need to know the scriptures from, from Genesis to Revelation. We think that we need to know a whole bunch of stuff. No. All you need to know is what Christ has done for you. Amen. And tell them how he can do the same thing for them. Here's, here's what the folks said. It ain't no secret what God can do. What he's done for others. He'll do the same for you. See, that's that's just being a witness right there of giving the good news and sharing it with people. It was necessary. It was necessary. Because we need the gospel and we need to be sharing the gospel with other people. You know, in the minds of these two individuals as they walked the road of Emmaus, they thought 
in their disappointment and in their grief that it was all over. That it was all over. That it was done. That, that Jesus had been defeated and their hopes, their dreams, their aspirations, everything, it was, it was gone. And it was just a horrible thing. But they did not understand that, hey, it was necessary. Yes. It was necessary so that he could get up again yes. and give us the power to get up. Yes. But not only that, it was necessary so that he could send the Holy Spirit, the comforter, our paraclete, the one who comes alongside of us to instruct us in the word of God and to comfort us through life. It was necessary for Jesus to do what he did, to go through what he went through in order for us to receive the benefits. Yes. that we receive and in order for this world to get what is before them today. My, my desire this morning is that you be encouraged. That you be encouraged as you continue to celebrate the resurrection of Christ and be confident in knowing that hey, it was a necessary event. And as a result, Look what has come out of it for us. I don't know how many times people have been through something that they thought was bad, but then by and by, by and by, they begin to see that, hey, wait a minute, it was the best thing that happened. I thought it was a bad thing, but it turned out to be the best thing that ever happened. Amen? Amen. Let's stand as we look to the Lord this morning. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Stand with